Well, good evening, Calvary Chapel, Lehigh Valley. Please be seated. If you would, open your Bibles to Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 8 tonight. So Lord, we lift this study up to you tonight. Lord, we pray for your hand upon it, for each one here, that your word would go out loud and clear, Lord. That it would, as you've told us, not return void. That those who hear it, Lord, would be changed by it, convicted by it, encouraged by it. Lord, your word has so, so much meaning for all of us. It meets us where we're at, and that's what we pray tonight, Lord, that you would meet us here where we are at. We ask it and we pray it in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Daniel 1, verse 8. The king answered and said, I know for certain... Oh, where are we at here? It's chapter 2. Let's try chapter 1. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. <clears throat> you know, when I see those words, but Daniel, it reminds me of but God, right? That's where my mind goes. Those two words are the most encouraging, the most hopeful, the most life-changing words in the Bible, but God. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not speaking heresy here. It's not blasphemy. I'm not saying Daniel is God, but God is about to work through Daniel to change his life and the life of those around him. And so we could read this verse as, but through God's word, Daniel had the strength of character not to allow himself to be defiled. Now, I want to read a few verses to you of where, but God had life changing outcome. For those who were involved. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Genesis 50 20. So you know this story. Pulled into slavery by his brothers, he winds up in Egypt. After a series of what the world would consider setbacks, but God called it his plan and purpose for Joseph. Joseph finds himself in the court of Pharaoh. He finds himself as the, most, the second most important man, the second most influential and powerful man in the nation of Egypt. And that position put him there, or the position that he was in, rather, in Egypt, was during a severe famine. So he was put in charge of the food right in the midst of this severe famine. And the famine, we know, brings Joseph's brothers to Egypt searching for food. And the point, at some point in the story, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And they're afraid. They're afraid that Joseph now is going to want to get even with them for what they had done to him. But instead, Joseph responds with this. But God, but God meant it for good. God meant it to preserve many people from the famine, especially the Jewish people. But God changed the lives of all involved that day. Joseph was reunited with his brothers. His family was healed. The Jewish people were saved from starvation, and the Jewish people wind up in Egypt for the exodus to take place to the promised land. What Satan had meant to destroy the Jewish people, God used to make them even stronger. Only, 12, only the 12 sons, Jacob and the children and grandchildren, went into Egypt, but over 2 million came out in the exodus. So they came out even stronger, but God, only God could have arranged that. The other but God verse is found in Romans. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. That's a life changer right there for every human being on the planet. While we were still sinners, Jesus looked at each and every one of us and said, I would die for each of those so that they can have life. Meaning that even the worst sinner among us can have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. One more. 
But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, 5, and 4. Again, but God. God turned the tables on Satan. Satan only wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But through God's rich mercy and grace, he provided a way for us to be made alive, for us to have life in Christ through the sacrifice of Jesus. And by his grace, we have been saved from sin, Satan, and the grave. So when we read, but Daniel, it tells us that God's about to change some lives with that statement, that some things are going to change, that some things are going to be turned upside down. And I want you to think about that word, but, in another context for a minute. But means Daniel's on his own. But as in everyone else but Daniel was going to eat the king's delicacies. Everyone else but Daniel was going to compromise their faith. Everyone else but Daniel will remain faithful and obedient to God. Now you see, Daniel may have been immersed in a secular world, but it didn't affect his testimony. Daniel remained faithful and obedient in a godless place. And that faith, that obedience, him purposing in his heart, not only changed his life, but it changed three of his friends' lives as well. But Daniel was determined. Daniel purposed in his heart, meaning he had already established in his heart long before he ever got to Babylon that he was going to serve God no matter what that meant, not man. He was steadfast. He was resolute. He was determined to stay faithful to the word of God no matter what. Daniel was immovable in his conviction. Paul wrote, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Listen, we should be the same way when it comes to the things of God, right? Steadfast and immovable. Compromise is defined as a settlement of a dispute that's reached by each side making concessions. That is how we compromise. And there's times in our life when compromise is good. There's time in our lives when we need to make concessions. Like when you want Italian and the wife wants Chinese and you compromise on Mission Barbecue, which is always a good choice, by the way. Or you want to go to the cabin in the mountains and your wife wants to go to the cabana on the beach, but you compromise on a spot near the lake. Or you want to watch an action movie and your wife wants to watch romance, so you compromise on a comedy. Get the picture? <coughs> So there's times and there's situations when compromise is not only good, it's healthy for your marriage. But not when it comes to the Word of God. In that case, compromise is never good and it is never spiritually healthy. We do not make concessions for God's Word. We, we Rather, we live by it and try to obey it to the letter. To compromise, to make a concession, is to say that the Word of God is insufficient. And that Jesus, the word of God in the flesh, is somehow not enough. Believers compromise all the time. They compromise in ways they may not even be aware of. And the main reason some compromise is because they aren't aware of what God's word says. They don't know the word of God, so they don't even know that they're compromising. Many compromise to avoid being labeled as bigoted or being self-righteous. Listen, standing on the word of God makes us stand out. And there are Christians who are uncomfortable with standing out in the crowd. They might compromise because they want to be relevant, believing that if they dress and act like the world, they'll be a better fit in the culture, therefore they'll be able to reach more people with the word. The problem with that attitude, of course, is that we're not called to compromise. We're not called to make concessions. We're called to stand out, to stand up, and to be set apart. To stand out in a situation where others know that we're different because the light of Christ shines in us. To stand up for what is right, that doesn't make us self-righteous. It just means that the righteousness of Christ causes us to want to see the right thing done for the right reasons. To be set apart, we're not part of this world. We're citizens of heaven. We represent Jesus as his ambassador. We are set apart. And so Daniel stood up. Daniel stood out. And Daniel was set apart. Daniel stood out from the rest of the young nobles as he requested that he may not defile himself 
before God. Daniel stood up for what he knew to be right. You see, just because what everyone else is because everyone else is doing it doesn't make it right, does it? And Daniel was set apart. He was different than the others, and that caused the others, especially his three friends, to want to be more like Daniel. Jesus commended the church in Philadelphia because they stood out from this world, because they stood firm on his word and did not deny his name. And so we could say that they stood up for Jesus, that they were set apart as followers of Christ by not denying his name, and, they ma and that made them stand out as a church. And look who it made them stand out to. Jesus noticed them. They stood out for Jesus. Jesus, Jesus no, and I want to be a church where Jesus notices us. But there was no place for compromise in that church as there's no place for compromise in this church. Daniel was faithful and he was obedient to the word of God. And I want you to take note that Daniel, God didn't make Daniel obedient and faithful so that he could use him. God was able to use Daniel because he was faithful and obedient. And that, by the way, is two, I think, of Daniel. Of think of Daniel's best qualities, faithfulness. We are faithful when, as Jesus said, we stand firm on his word and not deny his name. We're faithful when we do that, meaning we're faithful to his word. We faithfully put his word into practice in our life. We're, we faithfully live by his word, and we never compromise or water it down. We never take the word of God and make it fit or squeeze into our lifestyle. That means we're faithful to his word. We stand firm. Stand firm means to guard in the Greek, to keep the word of God, to keep it. The psalmist wrote, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, Psalm 119.11. And that's some of the best advice we could ever get, right? Because, I mean, there's, come, there's coming a time when the Bible, just having it in your home could be illegal. So the best place to have the Bible is hidden in your heart. The word's hidden in your heart. No one can ever take it away from you. And by keeping the word in your heart, it acts as a filter. Because we run everything we do and say through that filter of his word, and that keeps us from sin. God said this to his prophet Isaiah, But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of contrite spirit, who trembles at my word, Isaiah 66, 2. So God looks at those who tremble at his word. And that word tremble means fear and respect. I love the way one commentator put this. He said, when he, when he says tremble at the word, that means when you and I face the word of God, we are awed by it. We are struck by it. We are affected by it. We are impressed by it. Something happens to us when we, we, when we read the word of God. And that's a great reminder for us. Does something happen to us when we read the word of God? Or do we just read it for the sake of reading it? Satan, for one, hates the word of God because he knows it has the power to change people. He knows it has the power to lead them to Yeshua. Now, one of the first things that Satan attacked in the garden was the word of God. Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And what he was saying to Eve is, did God really say that? The enemy has been attacking God's word ever since then. He whispers in our ear, is that really what the word of God says? Is that really what God said? And if you don't know the word, you won't know the answer to that question. The enemy is always trying to get us to doubt the word of God so the enemy can get us to believe his lies just as he did with Eve. Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and the father will love him and he will come to him and make our home and we will come to him and make our home with him. John 14, 23. John wrote, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5, 3. Again, a commentator wrote, the heart, the heart God delights in is a heart that is compliant, cooperative, and responsive to him and his commands, a heart that obeys. So to keep God's word is to show our love for him. And that's a big part of, a big part of that, a big part of us showing our love for God is obedience. God prefers our obedience rather than our sacrifice. To obey the word of God is to surrender to God. A heart completely surrendered to him is a heart that's inclined to do his will and to keep his word and to obey his commandments. So be 
We don't deny his name. Now, the most common way we deny the name of Jesus is by our actions. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works, Titus 1.16. You see, to proclaim Jesus with our lips and live in contradiction to that proclamation is to deny Jesus. The way we live can contradict what we speak. The way one commentator put this is, our lust is a denial of God's good plan for sexual desire. Our pride is the denial of God's place as center of all things. All of our disobedience is the denial of God's role as rightful Lord of all creation. So we have the name of Jesus written on us. And to live in, in a way that's contradictory to that word, to the word of God, is to deny his name. And the second thing that is one of Daniel's best characteristics was his obedience. Being obedient is, a num- is important in a number of ways. First, obedience to God proves our love for him. First John 5, verses 2 to 3 say, We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments as his commandments are not burdensome. Second, obedience demonstrates our faithfulness to him. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God but does not obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. Third, obedience glorifies God in the world. Be careful to live properly among unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. 1 Peter 2.12 And fourthly, an obedience opens avenues to blessings for us. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. John 13.17 And so we find that faithfulness in Daniel because Daniel stood firm on the word of God and didn't deny his name by his action. The way Daniel lived, his life brought glory to God. It demonstrated his love for God. And I want you to think about that. If Daniel had eaten the king's delicacies, we would have never heard from him again in the Bible, would he? Would we have? Had Joseph given in and compromised his faith and slept with Potiphar's wife, we would have never heard from him again in the Bible. God would have used someone else to save his people. God's will would have been done. He just would not have used Joseph to do it. But instead, Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis 39, 9. Remember the baker who refused to bake the cake for the same-sex weddings? Had he compromised his faith and went ahead and baked those cakes, we would have never heard of him. He would have never been in the news. But because he was determined to stand up, he stood out to the Christian community, and he showed all of us what it means to be set apart. And God will use us in a mighty way if we steadfastly, resolutely, and determinately refuse to compromise. God will use us mightily if we remain faithful and obedient to his word. We may stand alone in our convictions, but we will never be alone as God is always with us and he promised to always be with us. So Daniel requested of the chief eunuch that he not be made to defile himself. And so that brings us to another part of the message. But Daniel would not be defiled. To be defiled is to be stained, soiled, or desecrated. Now up until this point, Daniel has, had had little control over his situation. You know, they could take this young man out of his culture, but they could never get him to fully assimilate into theirs. They could change his name to reflect their God. But they could never take the name of the one true God away from Daniel because that name it was written on his heart. They could give him a Babylonian education, but they could never get him to turn from the truth of God's word. Daniel had no control over those areas. He's a captive. He's a prisoner of Babylon. But there was one area where he could have some control, and that was over what he ate. Now, there's three reasons most commentators believe that Daniel would not eat the king's delicacies. First, it wasn't kosher. Daniel would have known the dietary laws in Leviticus 11, and he would not want to have eaten unclean meat that would defile him under the law. But I don't know if that belief really holds up very well because wine wasn't excluded in that law, and he wouldn't drink the wine either. 
in the New Testament, Jesus puts an end to this argument anyway when, when he comes to the earth and he says, Now what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, not what goes into the mouth, rather, defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth, this defiles a man. And God, of course, illustrated this for Peter when Peter was in a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Acts 10, verses 11 through 15. So what was previously unclean, God had made clean. And I don't think, well, we'll get to that. But, you know, what, what God said to Peter in Acts 10, isn't that a picture of our salvation? We were once stained by sin, unclean. But we're washed clean by the blood of Jesus. We're made clean. And what God has made clean is clean. And nobody could take that away from us. What's in us now is the Holy Spirit. And he controls everything that comes out of us in word and deed, as long as we don't quench his work in our lives. Second reason that they believed Daniel would need of the delicacies was that it was sacrificed to idols. Exodus 34, 15 warns against that. It warns against food sacrificed to idols, and there were many idols in Babylon, and they would have sacrificed the best of the best food to their, to their pagan gods. And so once that food was sacrificed, all that food would have been put on the king's table, the best food, the best of the best, his delicacies. Now, I don't know that that was the case either, because they wouldn't be eating the food out of re out of, in rebellion against God's word. They would have been eating it just to survive. I mean, there was no other food to eat. And I don't believe, and I do rather believe, that at some point, Daniel does eat the meat. Now, I know there have been diet plans out there, you know, the Daniel diet where you just eat vegetables all the time. But I don't believe that Daniel ate vegetables for 70-plus years of Babylon. Flip over real quick, if you would, to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. So Daniel's in mourning. He's not fasting because he said the only thing he would eat was the tasty food. So you can conclude that perhaps he ate vegetables instead. But this verse says that he didn't eat any meat or drink wine until the three weeks were up, implying that he did eat meat and drink wine after the three weeks. Listen, eating vegetables all day long, every day, gets a little boring, doesn't it? It's just tasteless. And perhaps that's why he calls this stuff tasty food. I mean, that's why there's the acronym PETA, right? P-E-T-A. People eating tasty animals. <laughs> eating vegetables for 70 plus years without any protein is just going to make you weak. You're going to be like a veal. So I believe that at some point in his life, Daniel did partake of the tasty food offered in Babylon. And the third reason is that they would have been in fellowship with the enemy. By partaking of this food, he would, that would have made them part of the culture and caused him to compromise. But that doesn't hold up very well either because he ate the vegetables. So I believe there's a fourth reason. If they ate the king's delicacies and they were found to be better than the rest because they were all beefed up, the king would have received the glory. This was the king's plan. It would have all been about the king. But by saying no and eating the vegetables only and then growing better and fatter than the rest of them, God received the glory, not man. And Daniel, as you're going to see as we go through this book, was always sure to make, give God the glory in everything he did. And think of the opportunities that we have in the course of a day to give God the glory for things that happen in our lives. You know, Paul wrote to two churches to do all they do for the glory of God. To Colossians, he wrote, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. To the Corinthians, he wrote, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
So we glorify God, or we are to glorify God. And the ways we do that is when we forgive people. Because unforgiveness can lead to bitterness, and bitterness defiles us. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, Hebrews 12, 15. We glorify God when we give grace to others, when we love our enemy, when we help our, name, our neighbor in the name of Jesus. Now the word glory, as it relates to the Old Testament, carries with it the idea of the greatness of splendor. The word glory in the New Testament means dignity, honor, praise, and worship. And when you put those two things together, you find that glorifying God means to acknowledge his greatness and give him the honor due to him by praising and worshiping him. We praise and worship him and him alone because he is the only one deserving of our praise and worship. He's the only one deserving of our honor. Daniel gave God the glory by telling others what God could do. He gave God glory by seeking God first, not man. He gave God glory by giving praise to God for the outcome and not taking credit for himself. So how do we give glory to God in our lives? Much the same way Daniel did. You know, when a blessing comes our way, we should tell others about it. We should say, praise the Lord for what he's done in my life. When an outcome to a situation that we've been praying for works out for us, we praise God for the outcome, not the external circumstances that other people see. We give God glory when we tell others of his faithfulness, of his mercy, of his grace, of his love, of his sovereignty and power. God is glorified when we brag about him and not our own abilities. Amen? Look at verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. But Daniel found favor. Because of Daniel's faithfulness, because of his obedience, and his selflessly giving God the glory, God honored Daniel's faithfulness by allowing him to find favor in the eyes of his captors. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So God honors those who honor him. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. John 12, 30, uh, 26. King Solomon wrote, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs 16, 17. 16, 7, rather. So Daniel's ways pleased the Lord, and he found favor in the sight of his captors because God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs being favored is having someone's approval and that's something we all long for by the our loved ones and, and our friends around us don't we we long for that approval but never as much as we long for God's favor in Hebrew to be favored means to gain approval for or to find grace in someone's eyes in Greek the word favor is charis and it means graciousness toward someone else so we always have God's love. We always have God's love through his grace. But does he approve of us? Do we find favor in the eyes of God? Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6.8 Joseph experienced favor because the Lord was with him. Genesis 39.3 and 4 Moses found favor in the sight of God. Exodus 33.17 Mary, the mother of Jesus, found favor with the Lord. Luke chapter 1, verse 25 and 30. Jesus found favor with God and with people. Luke 2, 52. So how can you and I find favor with the Lord? The prophet Isaiah wrote, For my hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble, and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word, Isaiah 66, 2. So we find favor with the Lord when we're humble, when we tremble at his word. Favor in the New Testament is closely related to grace. You, must, you might have recognized that word, charis. But it's God's grace through our faith that we're saved. So 
And the Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. So in a sense, we already have his favor because we have eternal life through Christ Jesus. But we also find favor with God by the way we live our life. The author of Hebrews said this of Moses. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Hebrews 11.25. You know, when we can say that about ourselves that we'd much rather be mistreated and not partake of the fleeting pleasures of sin so that we don't displease God, then we know that we found favor with God. God said this about Noah, who had found favor with God. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God, Genesis 6-9. Noah did the right thing in a time when everyone else was doing the wrong thing. Joseph found favor with God when he faced an overwhelming temptation. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? Joseph loved God more than he loved sin. Mary found favor with God through an unquestioning obedience. When she was told that this unmarried girl from Nazareth would bear the Son of God, this was her response. Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, Luke 1.38. No wonder she was highly favored of God. May we reply with such obedience when faith, faced with a situation that's beyond our comprehension. Jesus found favor with God, and, and listen, there's too many examples of why he was favored, but one that sums it all up, not my will, but your will be done. We find favor in God, with God when we want his will for our lives, not our own. So if you want to find God's favor, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, Matthew 6, 33. Look at verse 10. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your face looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Now the difference here is that Aspenaz, who is the chief of the eunuchs, feared man, and Daniel feared God. King Nebuchadnezzar was no doubt a powerful man. He could have to take a man's life with just a snap of a finger. And it probably wouldn't be a smart thing to do to test the king in this matter. Nebuchadnezzar had assigned this meal plan to the nobles in, a, in the hopes of bringing them up to Babylonian standards. And if they failed to achieve what the king wanted, those who were tasked with carrying this out would have been put to death. Anyone refusing to participate in this would have either been imprisoned or put to death. And I want you to take note that Daniel didn't refuse the king's meal plan. He asked permission from the chief of the eunuchs if he could only eat vegetables, him and his friends. Only the hand of God made this possible, but God. God made, it, made Daniel and his friends acceptable to the chief eunuch. Although the eunuch was a little bit more, was, was a little bit more concerned about losing his life, but the bottom line is, who do you fear? Do you fear God or do you fear man? You know, after the disciples had been arrested, and this is one of my favorite accounts in the Bible, and they were commanded by the Sanhedrin not to preach the name of Yeshua, and this was their response. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man, Acts 5, 29. So after they had told them never to mention the name of Jesus again, and they beat them just for an exclamation point, this is what they did. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily, daily, every day, in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. That was their response. Their faith overshadowed their fear, and they continued to do daily what they were called to do. Faith is another way we find favor with God. Not just our faith in our Lord Jesus, but faith in trusting in him for the outcome. We don't fear a man. We don't fear a virus. We trust in our Lord. Look at verses 11 and 14. 11 to 14, rather. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit. So deal with your servants. So he consented with them, and in this matter, and tested them ten days. What was about to be tested here was Daniel's faith in God. And listen, I've said many times, I'm sure you've heard of the faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And this is one of the first real tests of Daniel's faith, and there would be many more. Daniel had faith. He had faith that if he honored God, God would honor him. And there have been times in our lives when our faith has been tested. And it seems to me that the more my faith is tested, the stronger it becomes. The more we react, the more we, let me get this straight now, the more we react in faith to the little problems in our lives, the stronger our faith becomes, enabling us to react in faith when the bigger things happen. So don't look at every setback and every problem as a difficulty in life. Look at them as an opportunity to exercise your faith. Each time we react in faith, our faith becomes stronger. And when those storms come, when those big storms come, we're going to be anchored to the rock and we will not fall. Daniel's faith would grow stronger and he would need that faith because there's going to come a time when he's going to be lowered into a lion's den. So remember that each problem in life prepares us to react in faith when those storms come. Look at verses 15 and 16. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the store took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. But Daniel was a witness. His faith in God brought glory to God. But it also was a witness to those around him, including the Chaldeans. What should not have worked, because listen, nobody ever bulked up eating vegetables. Nobody. It worked because God's hand was in it. God made a way where there shouldn't be a way. I mean, I have nothing against vegetables. But nobody's ever won a strongman competition by eating peas and carrots. It's all about protein. Listen, maybe you're facing an overwhelming situation tonight, and you don't know how you're going to get through it. Remember, God can always make a way when there is no way. Amen. Amen. You know, you know how great God is? I was right in the middle of studying and preparing this part of the message today, and I get a phone call from somebody I love dearly, and they're really struggling because they had a, an issue in life that set them back few thousand dollars and they didn't know what to do they were really struggling with this because they had been trying to be faithful praying trying to do the right thing and it just seemed like this hit them at the wrong time and it was it's never a good time to be set back a few thousand dollars right and so I explained to them that you're going to do the right thing by paying this money it's not like they did know it they did owe it you're going to do the right thing by paying it if you're faithful to honor God by doing this, he's going to be faithful and honor you in some, other, in some way. That this money will come back to you maybe even more. And so it made them cheer up a little bit. But I said, here's, here's the cool thing. You call me with this problem, and I'm right in the middle of this very part of the message where we talk about having faith in God for the outcome. And in an overwhelming situation, God's going to make a way where there is no way and I believe that God's going to make a way for them. Right now, it seems like there's no way. There seems like there's no way out of this. But God's going to make a way. Those words, but God, are life-changing. They're life-saving. God can make a way where there is no other way possible. And don't ever forget that. Amen. Now, if you want to place your faith in Christ Jesus tonight, if you want to have that power, the power of God in your life, it's as simple as taking a walk down a Roman road. Walter's taking that walk right now. <laughs> the first step down the Roman road to salvation begins with admitting that you're a sinner. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. 
Now, listen, you may believe that you're a good person, that you've done good things in your life, that all those things that you've done in your life, you should be able to stand before God one day and, and tell him, sell him how good you've been. But based on those two verses, we see that none are righteous, none are good. We can't be good enough. We can't possibly be good enough. And listen, the plain, simple truth of the matter is, is that we could work our way into heaven. Jesus would never have had to die on the cross. We're sinners. And the road, the next step on the Roman road is to salvation tells us the consequences for our sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6.23. But you know, it's not all bad news. We do talk a lot about sin, but that's not the, that's the consequences of sin. The good news is that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. Jesus laid his life down for us so that we could be set free from the sin that binds us. Jesus paid the price for our sin on the cross, which is death. And by Jesus' resurrection, it proves that God accepted the payment for our sin. So the next step on the Romans road to salvation is to confess that you need Jesus to be set free from and forgiven for your sin. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10.9. Because Jesus laid his life down for us, all we have to do is believe in him, trust in him, ask him to be our Lord and Savior, submit our lives to him, surrender our wills to him, and trust in his sacrifice for the payment of our sin, and we will be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. And once you call upon the name of the Lord, and you're forgiven, you're reconciled to God, that brings us, or gives us rather, peace of mind. It restores us to peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. Once you've walked down the road to salvation and you've called upon the name of Jesus and you're saved, the blessings don't end there. You're set free from condemnation. There now is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. For those who are in Christ Jesus, do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, Romans 8.1. And we have eternal security. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38-39. So I pray if you're listening to the sound of my voice tonight that you would make that decision to walk down that Roman road. It will be the best journey and the best decision you've ever made. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and worship our Lord. Lord, thank you. For our brother Daniel, thank you for the amazing lessons that we can learn from his life. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take those lessons and apply them to our life. We ask it and pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.